Welcome to Cash Up, a weekly show where we converse with amazing folks in DFIR. And today I'm so excited to be joined by James Duffy, who's been motivating me to no end. Typically, I introduce folks who have been in this field for years. Today, I'm excited to instead introduce you to someone we all should know who has been researching and sharing content since early this year, but in quantities that are unfounded. James is an iOS security researcher who's been making contributions to the community. He started sharing his research earlier this year with his blog starting in May. Since then, he shared 33 technical blog posts, mostly pertaining to iOS and iDevice research. He's been building and sharing tools, including 28 projects on his GitHub that he's posted again within this year. His tool, ZPet, is really interesting, and he even did an update to that today, including providing Twitch streams that were of his entire process and development and posting and sharing that to YouTube. His tools are helpful for research, particularly with iOS, and there's a handful of really neat current projects, including iBox, Ultra Restorex, Agent Live, ZPet, iLibX, and many more. He's even written a book, which is currently sent out to print, that's made to take a beginner through the process to become an iOS security researcher. I'm really looking forward to when my copy arrives. Again, he live streams and shares his content on YouTube and Twitch, publishes blogs, writes books, shares massive amounts of code, all of this in 2020. He's also a supporter of mental health causes and raises money through donations on his website to the Tim Bergling Foundation. Did I mention he's only 19 years old and a university student? University student? And with that, this is James Duffy. Hi, James. Hi, Jessica. Good afternoon. <laughs> thank uh, you so much for having me. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to you. Uh, and I guess I'll just start off by mentioning that you are joining us from the UK. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so to uh, thank you and welcome. I'm sure we usually have an international crowd, but specifically if we have some friends uh, from the UK, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, Zane Raza is saying, yay, James. So you definitely have some some fans already uh, oh, in the super audience. Super kind, super kind. <laughs> So with that and all of this great content you've been putting out, can you tell us a little bit about how you got here? Oh, so um, I, I, I guess I, I've been interested in IT since a really, really young age, um, maybe like six or seven or something. Um, and so, so my dad, he had this desktop computer and he didn't really use it too much. And he was like, um, every single time I went to school, I would just be waiting. I would just be like, oh, I really want to go home. I really want to just get on the computer and just have a look, see what's going on. Because the the opportunities for experimentation um, and learning new things were absolutely limitless. I mean, for the, for the first few years, um, I never actually had any internet access either. So I was sort of oh. just like, uh, whatever utility CDs I could find, um, I, I was always down the down to the shops every week to pick up there was this magazine um and it had like a windows cd inside and it would have like the utilities of the week it was like you yes. know it was really really fun i would take it back plug it in experiment i would click every single button <laughs> and just have a ton of fun um and fr from there uh the it, it's been a very iterative process um just learning new things um and yeah, um, I, I've, I've been working on a lot of projects um, privately, but I, what I've done in the past year or so is I've started to publish those uh, projects on the GitHub and Twitter. It. And it, it's, it's been an amazing journey. Um, you know, I, I'm really, really thankful for everybody in the community uh, who has supported me through, through that. Um, and it really means the world. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it's, so it's I, just the words. <laughs> I love this because you have this young interest, uh, you, know, you know, in just figuring out how things work and that thirst and you're playing with things and you're trying to figure them out. And so you fall in love with this. You go and you're picking up the CDs and the weekly oh, pubs yeah. <laughs> uh, at the shops. You're putting them in. You're toying with everything. You're trying to figure out how the utilities work. I remember playing with those discs. It seems <laughs> ancient to me. Uh, <laughs> doing similar things. Um, and so... Then you 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 finish that you're you're playing with that the whole time you're in school and then you decide to learn on your own go to university to study computers what oh. what was kind of the path from there? 
Yeah, so um, I started programming when I was around 12 years old, I think. Um, yeah, I started with Python. And awesome. I was always really interested in, because everything was such a long process, just sort of going from A to B, um, I was sort of like, I really want to shorten down this process and try and automate parts of parts of my day, if you like, because I spent so much time at the computer. I was just sort of like, if I can make some of that shorter, then I can spend more time exploring and oh, that's awesome. yes. uh, learning more. So I, um, I had this Android phone at the time. It was a Motorola G, I, I think. Um, and there, there was this issue where if you downgraded Android on a specific device, it would brick the bootloader. Mm -hmm. And so what I did is I built this tool for the community, which would uh, automate in Python, uh, essentially downgrading the firmware in a safe way that it wouldn't boot loop the device. Um, and yeah, that was that was really where it started in terms of um, developing software. And I love from, that. from that point onwards, uh, I really took an interest. I love that. So what are you working on today? What are your what are your current projects? If Motorola bootloader uh, fixes to prevent you from bricking your device as you downgrade it, which I know that forensicators regularly downgrade their devices to put them at the <laughs> same state as the device they're researching to check system artifacts on different yes. iOS and different uh, Android versions, but not typically something that most users do or many users do. So that's pretty interesting in itself and the fact that that's where <laughs> your, your interests were. Uh, what does that bring you to, to the projects you're working on today? What kind of projects do you have going on? Well, I mean, in the past six months, I've um, developed quite a lot of iOS related um, projects, um, specifically in the area of like sort of research and allowing us to um, delve into the device and the data it holds. And um, I originally become interested in iOS sort of research specifically when I, I was actually on YouTube and I saw this video from Celebrite. And mm. I, I saw them plug in this phone into the computer. The, the iPhone screen just goes blue. And then you see all the data pop up on the display. And I, I, it sort of triggered a thought. I was just like, how are they doing that? And that's when I took a step back and I went straight to the computer. And I was at it every single day um, for <laughs> until now, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you were on it today. You released an update about it. Like it's, it's, <laughs> Yeah, from that point onwards, it was just, yeah. Um, and it, it sort of really stoked me when I was sort of taking a look at the file system. It's just every single time or like every, the, each file I looked at uh, when the phone was in a locked sort of state, I, I was just absolutely stoked every single time. Like then the next file, I was just like, <laughs> every, every, every single one. And I was like, wow, um, just just sort of seeing that data in a decrypted form was just, um, yeah. It's it was, exciting. I, I mean, we get it. It's totally exciting to see that data coming across from, from a device. And you're like, wait a second, this is in a decrypted state. How is this working? How is this functioning? And I love that instead of saying, what do I do with this? You said, how does that work? Yes, and exactly. I, I love that. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. And then it, it's almost like you've gone ahead and done parallel research because you're not reverse engineering these tools. You're no. going, I'm going to figure out how the security enclave works, how these different things work, and go ahead and build my own creations to do similar or different functions. And I just think it's it's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, I, I, I've been interested since that point in how that sort of encryption sort of state handling really works because... I found that sometimes some artifacts are available in BFU and other times they're not. And it, it was incredibly interesting just sort of trying to figure out what puts it in that state. So that, for example, if, the, if there was a device which was AFU at the time, which you can't exploit because you haven't booted it with Checkmate, how can you ensure that the maximum amount of artifacts are available when you reboot it into BFU? Um, and yeah, it's, I, I think it comes it's a great question. Question, right? Because you yeah. want to ensure, um, especially when you're taking a forensics perspective, and this is what I love because I feel like you're a researcher who's always thinking about the forensic questions without having had that forensic investigation experience. And I love that because you're like, wait a second, what artifacts am I possibly 
losing or changing or altering as I change the state of this device? And what do I do to make sure I get the maximum amount of data from the yeah. user with the least amount of change or from the system? And I just am so uh, in tune with the fact that you have that mindset without having conducted traditional <laughs> examinations, which is usually how people get it. And it's almost natural for you in terms of your whole story about how you got into this, um, the <laughs> testing and the research. And I just love it. Oh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I've also been working on the solution, whereas um, currently we boot the device with CheckGrain and then we extract the data through that. But I guess in BFU, one of the most critical sort of um, pieces of data are really the databases and caches and log files. And while the device is live, these, these files, they're likely to be purged, um, maybe modified while the device is turning on and booting. Mm -hmm. And so what I've tried to do is use a, a RAM disk, which is like a, it's like a smaller version of iOS mm -hmm. in which we can boot and mount the system partition as read-only so that it completely preserves that sort of integrity of the log files and caches that are there. And so because BFU is so sort of, um, so sort of uh, delicate in a sense with mm. the amount of data that we have and how we're going to access it, because I guess AFU, uh, so after unlock, the resources are there. They're, they are definitively going to be there because they're ready to be used. Whereas yeah. with BFU, you, it has to be treated so much more delicately because of the data is only going to be there temporarily. That data is ready to go. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And then, you know, the other point that Luis is bringing up, uh, Luis Martinez, who I love, Luis, it's so great to see you on here, um, is that he's saying one of the cool things about James is that he doesn't only say, I can do X. He also says, let me explain how you can do X as well. And here is how X works. And that's what I, and James and I were talking about this before the show, that one of the things I appreciate so much is not only is he contributing these projects, but when he writes code, he shares his process with you. He streams it. He's willing to share the how, the why, answer questions. We've had great conversations about these things. And you do that for the community. You write very robust blog posts. And you also share content for different types of perspectives. You definitely um, have, I've watched some of your YouTube videos where it is very, um, I'm going to explain to you how iOS security works. I'm going to explain to you how this function works. And I really appreciate the fact that you are simultaneous to doing exploitation and writing scripts to exploit things, that you are simultaneously sharing the how you got there, where you got there, and encouraging others in two ways, to do it themselves, oh, verify, yeah. validate, research more, and to share at the same time, that there's nothing yes. to be scared of in putting it out there. And I just admire that in you, and Thank it's you so just much. a great so, so thing. Fun. Um, I've got to tell you that Jack R uh, said go James and um, Exter says hi. Oh, or some Anne, Anne Anonymous. I, um, uh, apparently, I love Anne Anonymous, by the way. I have never seen a femme form for the word anonymous, and I love <laughs> Anne Anonymous. Uh, says hi from Exeter. Oh. Um, <laughs> I got to tell you, um, the ZPet project is really interesting, and so is Spider, because both are making research accessible. Would you like to share a little bit about those two projects? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, I think um, at the same time, that sort of teaching process and that sort of sharing process is also a learning process as well. Because as you sort of go through that process of writing a blog post, you sort of have to validate to yourself that this is right. And then you sort of take yourself back to that sort of, um, I'm going to make sure that that's right. And during that process, I'm probably going to learn something else. And with that, I can then back into the bug face. <laughs> and also, there's a whole collaboration effort, because I know you and I have had conversations about that whole process, about peer review and, and yeah. talking with others and collaborating, um, which gives you part of the, the validation and the verification process and, and ensures something stronger, but also ensures you understand it better, right? Absolutely. So, so I love it. So easy. Yeah, yeah. To to um, I think it's so easy to be able to look at something and just go, oh yeah, yeah, I, I know how that works. But then as soon as you really delve into it, as soon as you put it into that teaching form, it's Absolutely. like looking at it from another perspective, really, because you have to make it understandable to somebody else. 
Not only do you have to understand it enough to make it understandable to somebody else, but you have to be prepared for whatever questions you didn't yeah, think of yeah, that the other person's going to ask you. So it forces you to get such a deeper yes. knowledge set on it. I love it, right? Like one of the reasons I love teaching at the university is I learn so much from the questions yeah. I get asked because I'll be like, I don't know. Let, let's figure that out, right? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. And let's take that journey together and what would you do to try to figure this out? And I love that you're inspiring it. You know, um, Mike Williamson, uh, Forensic Mike One, uh, he's saying that this is something that many examiners take a career to figure out in terms of the need to share. Like, I I love that. So what's kind of driven the interest from going from computing to specifically into the digital forensics realm? What spun that? Yeah, so um, I would say for... Yeah, yeah, for DFIR, DFIR and data forensics specifically, um, I think that's that, that idea of being able to take data which is on the device, which I, I believe there's, um, I don't want to say a misconception, but I think that um, I think that the public can be under like a sort of impression that Apple devices 100% encrypted and everything is in a, everything is in a state where you could say, oh, yeah, you, you can have my iPhone, it's locked. You're never going to get anything from that. <laughs> and then being able to um, inspect the device and figure out exactly where this data is going to be, uh, being able to definitively gather that data using uh, the artifacts, and then being able to develop those and put it into a form where other people can go, huh, I, I want to start doing that. So then they take, um, then they could take, just say, for example, the spider project. Mm-hmm. Uh, they could input their own data, uh, take their own device's uh, root file system, and then Spider will identify their own data in that build. And it's going to dump database schemas and stuff like that to really potentially point out areas where people could identify uh, files of interest. And Spider is really interesting for exactly that reason for the forensics process. It makes some of the process of how do I discover where the artifacts of interest are where exactly is it being used? Because all of those references are there, right? It takes a BFU device, tells you where everything's referenced, and it gives you just such a jumping off point to either know what, well, to know where you're going to look once you get that data off and that acquisition and start the research. So it's really just a nice springboard uh, that you can bring into your forensics testing procedure and your research procedures. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess... Um, uh, as well, it can look in places that people might not look. Yes. There are so many directories. I mean, myself, I would have never thought to look in directory X and Y, um, but then you go like 10 directories deep and then there's this database file and then you're just like, wow. So okay. we were specifically talking about this in the pre-show. I was saying, you know, a lot of times I'll know the app of interest. I know I'm looking for everything under that package name in the file system, but yeah. I may be going through hundreds of files nested deep in cache and library, et cetera. And what's so great about this is you know what was referenced. You know what file path to go to to get started. And that springboard is just such a time saver. So really cool project. Love it. Love <laughs> it. So- before I started with uh, Spider, I actually, when I dumped the file system, I just run tree, and then I had it so it would display the file size, because there's a load of files which just show up as zero bytes. Mm-hmm. So I was just slowly working my way through this massive root file system tree, and I go, huh, that looks interesting. And then I would take it and I would manually look into it. Um, I started building this uh, Excel sheet of just this directory, this file, this might look interesting, this might respond to this, and then open that for further investigation. But I think Spider can sort of maybe potentially automate that process a little bit. Right, right. Like literally get you to the files of interest quicker within a specific application that you're researching. It's just, that's great. It's such a, it it really is from a research perspective and looking at applications that may have changed or unsupported, just brilliant. Um, So you have written this book that we're all waiting to get our physical copies of. Uh, Thank you for the (laughs) pre-read. I love the fact that you've taken this approach to walking people through how to start as a security researcher. You're making it accessible, but you're going into the technical methodology and walking through your approach. Um, 
what was your goal with this book? And I'll say that Luis mentions, you know, he goes, uh, Luis must have had a pre-read and he said, just wait until you lay your eyes on the book. Very conversational <laughs> approach to explaining complex topics. And I think uh, that's really uh, the key. Um, do you want to explain a little about your goals behind the way you wrote the book? Or That's really kind. Thank you. And um, I, I think the idea was for some of it is the fact that there's, there, there, there are some subjects where you sort of have to know a person that knows a person that knows a person in order to get the information you want for some specific uh, tasks. And um, o- over the past like sort of year or so, um, I've managed to talk to that person that knows a person that knows a person and sort of pick bits and pieces from different places. And then um, so sometimes I had some questions on Twitter about these sort of subjects. And I was sort of like, well, if I could put this into one sort of integrated um, sort of area that would take someone from not knowing anything about iOS to being able to confidently sort of interface with those sort of, you know, with with the intricacies of iOS, um, because I guess it's a platform that's quite, quite similar in a sense to macOS, but then it also has its own, it has its own sort of oddities as well. Mm-hmm. Um, which are important to take into account. Um, yeah, especially, for example, SSH over USB. Maybe, potentially, you might not really do that. I mean, um, it's probably not something which everybody comes across. Forensics examiners. <laughs> 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 but you're right, the general public probably isn't doing that. So. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so you've built all these amazing resources that you've been sharing. What's your go-to resource? Oh, um, well, if if one person has really, really inspired me, it has to be um, Billy Ellis. He is so inspiring. Um, and, yeah, we're, we're good friends. We talk about uh, these, this sort of research really often. And when we first met, I, I, was, I was talking with him, and I was sort of like, how did you get to where you are now? Because, you know, you've really built up a really amazing reputation in the community. And um, then, then he said to me, he said, um, James, build a profile, you know, start publishing because then you're going to be able to build that name. You're going to be able to help people and also build that motivation for working more because you know that it is making a difference. Yeah. And I felt that yes. as, well. like, as soon as you feel that something's making a difference, you really have that sort of internal motivation to, to go, I really want to make this the best it can be. I love it. And I love that you're just constantly sharing. I love the fact that you were motivated by somebody else to go ahead and and follow that same model who you met because Billy Elvis, he is Billy Ellis. Oh my gosh. He is the guy for arm, right? He's written those resource guides about how to deep dive in that. And, and you've taken this posture it seems that I am going to just continually produce and share my journey in iOS security research and what I love is there's almost like this simultaneous um, production where you're producing the tangible information about the tool you build the exploit you discover etc but at the same time you're producing what I would consider the metadata about that, like if putting it in forensics terms, which is the methodology you use to derive that and do that process. Um, and I think that's brilliant. And from a perspective of how people consume content, you're producing your content in so many different ways simultaneously. People who are comfortable reading your readme and going through the code and manually dealing with that can. People who want to read your blog posts can. People who want to go through the book can. People who want to watch your Twitch stream and see you (laughs) work live can do that if they're more of a visual audio learner. People who want, well, if they're more of a visual learner and then really your YouTube for more audio learners where you're really deep diving and explaining concepts and and i know that you use your twitch and your youtube streams a little bit differently yeah Um, yeah yeah for sure for sure yeah i mean oh sorry no please please (laughs) no i was gonna say uh yeah the, the, the twitch streams they normally last like a few hours um and for example the zedpet update the other day um i actually streamed the entire start to finish from the first version pretty much up up to the latest version like the entirety of that process was streamed i mean the testing um the development process uh the mistakes i mean the, the mistakes are so important to share 
it's you know I I um I shared a quote from my with my students last night at my uni class from Niels Bohr and it's an expert is somebody who's made every mistake in a niche yeah. field. <laughs> and it is one of my favorite definitions because the I, the idea that you're not going to make mistakes is and that's one of the things about sharing like your acceptance of that is what makes it, I believe, maybe so possible for you to share so much so easily and, you know, and recognizing you're going to make mistakes and that those, that's how you learn. And there's, I just think it's such a brilliant lesson that a lot of people take a really long time to learn. And I love the fact that you've already uh, taken a, I, I mean, I'm just going to be flat out. You inspire the crap out of me. You motivate the crap out of me because of how much you're sharing, researching, doing, and how in-depth you're getting and how you're not afraid to make mistakes, but you're also willing to, to jump on them and correct them. And I just think it's incredible. Um, you, you know, so you're kind, getting... So Thank you. You're getting some great comments. So Elon for Diva was our guest last week. She says that she's going to go need to binge watch your YouTube channel after this. <laughs> wow. And Jay says for us. Uh, Jay, I am so uh, apologetic if I am pronouncing your last name incorrectly. I actually don't know how to say it. Uh, but James tirelessly lives out his processes on Twitter. When does he have time to study for university? LOL. And it's it's a it is a question. Um, and I, I I actually have the same curiosity. How do you make time for all of these things? Um. Well, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I, I would say um, I, I, I spend as much time as possible doing the university work, but then I feel like parts of that can actually branch out into, and it can also like aid the learning process from so many different sort of perspectives. I mean, we can be doing a class on, for example, like the human element of security, and that can influence um, other research. And I feel like you can take parts and put it somewhere else. I love this because I try to, and, you know, this is something um, that I think is, is like a strong suit of like Alexis Brignoni and Geraldine Blay. And I know it's the way I used to function when I was in the forensics lab. People would be like, how can you do exams day in and day out and then publish artifacts or research? And really, it's because the Things that you're doing day in, day out are what's informing your hobby projects that you're producing. And that without them together, you wouldn't necessarily be producing meaningful work. The meaning from your work, yeah. it's not just like I'm casually going, oh, I want to explore this thing. No, I I, I choose to, to work on things or research things because somebody requests it. Yep. There is a case and a need that determines it, where I have a really strong personal uh, story and reason for wanting to understand that data source. It all comes from somewhere. It's not just randomly picking out in the air, oh, the next so thing true. I'm going to research is this. It's all informed by that entire picture. Yeah. And I love the fact that you do that. And I'm sure that your university work um, as well is informed by your hobby research and <laughs> your production. Because it's not hobby. Let's let's be 100% honest. You are a content creator. You are creating content that is being used by people who are professionals to further their research and their analysis, etc. You are doing work that is being utilized. So you are a content creator and um and the fact that you're informing those things to each other is just great synergy and it'll it helps you be better at both right so i think um when when i started sort of publishing work and stuff like that i was i was sort of under this impression with um but well, i i guess not really having interacted with any communities and stuff like that um I sort of just imagined in my head, I imagine this sort of like hierarchy sort of thing and stuff like that. But actually, once once you once you publish something, it doesn't matter whether you've got five followers or 500,000. Everybody is so friendly. And I, I feel that this, um, it, it, it was it was just so apparent. Everybody you, that you talk to inside the industry was willing to sort of, um, you know, willing to help you, uh, willing to talk about, you know, certain um, certain concepts and stuff like that. And I feel that that, again, that, that motivates other people. And that motivates yes! people. Yes! It's, uh, it's like... It's, that view that everybody is together. 
It's like how they say a smile's contagious or laughter's contagious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, the I, I cannot express, I don't know if you guys can see it through, but I don't know if you guys can understand how much James motivates me with his passion <laughs> and his drive and how much I'm feeding off of that and how much it makes me want to do more. And, and the other thing is, is you're spot on. The Digital Forensics Incident Response community, I think, is unlike any other community in the world yeah, in totally. terms of love and support and the fact that we are a flat organization. We recognize everybody, an organization in terms of a community that is an unorganized community. But the whole point is, is everyone can share. There's value in everybody from, I don't care if you're a student looking at your first hello world, you have an experience to share. And the fact that you can do that is just awesome. Yeah, it's uh, the fact that everybody works together as well. You know, no matter yes. what organization you're from or anything like that, you know, everybody just, you know, there, there's, there's all like this sort of, um, you know, atmosphere that everybody can share, everybody can help each other. And I suppose Absolutely. it's really one collective goal, really, isn't it? I mean, everybody's trying to, you know, it's just for a purpose. And we're all aware that none of us can do this mission alone, that we all have to work on each with each other, that we all have to build on each other, that we have to collaborate, and we all do. And also, you know, forensics is a little bit of a unique industry because we have to be able to testify to our work. We have to make yes. sure we're talking truth. So there's just a a very clean, uh, I guess there's no better way to say it than honesty to it in terms of yeah, everybody yeah, just like, work is the work and verify, validate, support, build on each other's work, collaborate. And, and you'll see so many brilliant collaborations by people from different parts of the industry with each other. And I, I just love it. I, I love our community. And also we welcome others with open arms and right. Like I hope yes. I, I'm so happy to hear you say, you know, that you feel like in this year that you've been specifically involved in the DFIR field, that oh, you feel absolutely. welcome to open arms because I'm glad that, that, that that's what we're actually doing. It's what we preach. It's what we hope for. And it's glad to hear you feel that way. I really feel like I've sort of, you know, like found my place in a sense, you know, as part of, you know, and it's, it's sort of, and the community has been a massive, like if anything, the, the biggest part of it is the fact that, you know, everybody does welcome you in and, I feel like that really differentiates itself to um, maybe, you know, some other industries and stuff like that. Everybody's just so closely tied. And it's, it's really nice. It's like one big family. <laughs> and our mission is so critical in what we're doing and finding yeah. justice or saving people on their worst day or helping yes. kids or whatever you're doing in digital forensics. You're doing something to better people, the world, help. And with a mission that's so strong and so centered to all of us, I think it it helps with that inclusion. I don't know if incredible, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like it feeds it. So some JS JPS thirteen laptop um, says James is very down to earth person to talk to and is one of the most genuine people that I know. Oh, it's oh, Josh. It's he, then, he then signed his name. And you know, just in the chats we've had, I agree. It's just such a a pleasure. Oh, like, that's so true. Pleasure. <laughs> getting to to chat with you and and talk with you so getting to know you a little bit more outside of the great content you are people want to know more about you what what's something about you that you'd like to share with us aside from the research and the forensics tools yeah um i i think uh, it's something which i've tried to be quite open about in the community is um uh my, my asperger's and adhd which i feel that um I feel positive, very, very positively influences uh, my workflow. Um, so, so I feel that outside of the work itself, um, right. I feel that that really sort of maybe um, I'm trying to think of the right way to put it, but I think it really tunes my thoughts in a sense. Mm. Um, in a sense, that you can really hyper focus on this one specific subject, um, and that's 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 good until. Um, something else takes your interest <laughs> <laughs> and then you move from that one subject I mean you, like you said my github is full of like so many different things and that's a collective of me looking at something being incredibly interested working my way through it and then when I'm done I figure something I'm like huh that <laughs> and then, then I move, make another project then something builds around it and then it's just so much like sort of intense focus um and that that really, um, yeah, it, it is, it's, it's very beneficial. I mean, when people say that, um, I, I in various points, sort of in life, I mean, pe people can say, 
sort of, you know, oh, Asperger's is going to hold you back, um, you know, and it's, it's going to make it really difficult for you to talk to people. And honestly, I, I do find communication really difficult sometimes, I do. But um, with that being said, um, you know, the community is so incredibly welcoming and I really enjoy teaching. I love it. Uh, it it's, it's one of my biggest passions. Um, and having that opportunity to really interact with the community, everybody is so friendly and welcoming that it makes me comfortable enough to do that. James, I cannot express how much I love the fact that you shared something um, about your journey and the way that you do things in your process and, and the existence of who you are that may really inspire others because representation matters. Finding others who have journeys similar to yours and then seeing how successful they can be because obviously you're very successful at what you're doing and you're inspiring others and you are sharing and anyone who tells you that something is that any part of you isn't something that you can turn into something positive. I am just so glad to see how positively you've turned that and what you've done. And so thank you. <laughs> your openness to share it really makes a difference because a lot of times some people, not a lot of times, I don't know, I don't have mathematical statistics on this and I don't like to be incorrect uh, in things that I'm saying, but I'm sure that there are human beings out there who would not express that and, and are thinking about, you know, how they see things maybe not in the positive light or see themselves as successful despite or successful because of or some success parallel. And yeah. I just love that you have the courage and the honesty and the transparency and the recognition that you're sharing that helps others just in the same way that you're sharing your forensic knowledge and your infosec knowledge and your security reversing knowledge helps others. So thank you. Oh, thank you so, so much. Um, I mean, there, there was definitely a time where I was sort of like, I sort of have this image in my head that I didn't really want to mention it or I didn't want people to know because I felt that they were going to look at me differently and stuff like that. But I still got to that point where I could sort of, you know, ha having um, worked with this and everybody being so welcoming, I think that was something which really brought, brought to light that actually, you know what, it can be a positive thing. And really, it is a positive thing. So, you know, being open about that can potentially help somebody else who might be sort of like, um, they might have their feet in the water a little bit. They might be having a look around uh, the industry um or you know considering publishing some work and I say do it <laughs> do it yes yeah. and it's just so motivational that you've taken that step um Lori says that she really wants her hunt to son to hear this and she thanks you because I think that that your story and how you've been so amazing in what you've done with your journey is going to inspire people even who aren't in this field and Lori says that she's found that people at Asperger's have the most brilliant minds and you absolutely are a brilliant Aww. mind and I think it's such a true statement that if people take their their story and I, I think we all have this I don't think I don't know, but I would imagine that there's not a human alive who doesn't have something that they've said I don't want to share this thing about me because they think or inside you think this thing makes me not seem as accomplished yeah, or strong definitely. or as this or as that. And I want to present my best self, right? The, like the self everyone presents on Instagram. Yes. But, yeah. But what, but what sometimes makes things more valuable is to share that other part of you so that other so people true. can feel that representation. And I found that, I mean, I think we all have those things. I had that thing about myself that I now openly share um, because I feel like it shows people that no matter where they come from, wherever you start, you can still make your journey a success. Not that it's going to be easy. No one's oh, saying it'll be easy. But thank you so much for sharing that. Oh. So speaking about journeys, what would you say is the advice you'd give to to someone who's interested in getting into digital forensics or into iOS security research or really delving into things. What's your advice to, to people who are going, how, how do I get started? No, I would say, um, and the, the, this, it, it kind of goes off what we were saying before, and this could, but actually, no, I think it's 
I think this is actually quite universal. I would say talk to people. Um, you know, if you see something which you're interested, I this was a couple of years ago now, but I actually um, approached a couple of people on LinkedIn and I sort of said, "Cool, this project's amazing." You know, how how what 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 did you sort of you know what was your process in this and how did you sort of come to that conclusion? And I think that people will be so positively um, uh, that they will they will respond. And I think that sometimes, um, well, I had this view that I was sort of, you know, oh, you know, I'll try and send a message. I'll see what happens. I didn't expect anything. Um, and then I think it was about a week later or something. He was like, oh, hi, James. Uh, let's schedule a call and talk. And I was like, what? <laughs> and, you know, I picked up so much information from that talk. And, yeah, just, just talking to people is so, so valuable. So you really get that personal insight as well. I love that. You sh um, you know, I think that's the common thing that people should be um, comfortable reaching out, that there's no reason yeah. not to reach out. It, it comes to that whole thing again, where as a community, we're flat. There is no hierarchy. Everyone should be accessible. Um, and everyone pretty much is. Um, and I'm sure if anyone had any questions and they reached out to you, you'd be happy to, to help 100%, them. 100%. Um, <laughs> actually, a good example of this is Billy Ellis, actually. Because um, I, I bought his book and then we were texting over, um, we were texting over, I think it was Discord, some platform like that. And I was, I was in London at the time. I was going to Splunk, Splunk Life. Mm -hmm. uh, I, had, I had some time around lunchtime and I was like, oh, hey, Billy, you know, would you like to go for lunch? And he was like, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> so we went out for lunch and we started this conversation and it was so, so inspiring. And just being able to talk with people um, and having that insight into their process I, th I think that sometimes that can be beyond the training itself. I mean, it can inspire Absolutely. you so much in order to um, begin that sort of practical journey. And there's, there's some things that can't be taught just from, you know, reading an article or something like that. Some things, if you talk to someone, it can really drive that inspiration so much. Well, I've got to be honest, in every conversation I've had with you, you draw that inspiration out and <laughs> you provide that to others. And I hope that everyone, and we do that for each other as a community, right? Like when I talk to Lori or I talk to Luis or I talk to Mike Williamson or I talk to Elon or I talk to Jay, I, I see you're all listening, but I've had conversations with you guys over varieties of mediums that really have inspired and set the next step. And we've all had conversations that are both technical and non-technical. Yeah, and I think that both, both have incredible value in growing and developing and you know i'm gonna be a hundred percent honest i am so impressed uh, because you're my my knowledge of you and my journey with you as far as knowing the work you're putting out and your tweets and and your content has only been you know uh what since may uh so you know we're talking we're talking six seven months and you have shared so much and provided so much thought and had so much great interaction with the community that it's fantabulous oh, the community, and i really couldn't be more thankful for it's just so um it, it means more than i think a lot of people can really realize it's just 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 you know having access to people and you know just being able to you know like sort of talk to people um about the work and having questions and stuff like that. It's just so valuable, so valuable. And I guess the other thing is, a good reminder is that we're, the work, your work is incredible and new and novel, but this sounds weird to share, to start, to have those conversations. It doesn't need to be new and novel. You don't have to have discovered a new artifact or a new exploit. You could be building on something else. You yeah. could be verifying or validating something on a different system. You could be applying a methodology to a new situation. And, you know, let's be honest, six million apps out there between Android, iOS, yeah. Blackberry, Windows. <laughs> Try and get one person to go through all of them. It's not going to happen. <laughs> you could absolutely find something that is new and different if that's what you want to yes. do. But And you can talk to people about their methodologies and then apply their methodology and develop your own and share about that. And so just thank you so much 
for, for doing that and for speaking to the value of connecting with others. And I mean, you made a comment earlier that, that you felt that communication um, might have been a struggle for you on your journey. And it's not. I mean, whatever that is, you have defeated that if that was a demon. <laughs> and if it, if it wasn't a demon, you just brought it in your journey and you are an excellent communicator. And that's part of what's helped you be successful in this because you communicate technical topics well. You have great conversational conversation. I've enjoyed talking with you. Um, and you're just an absolute pleasure, a brilliant mind. Thank you for all your giving back to the community. And thank you so much for being our guest today. Oh, that, that's so, so, so incredibly kind. I mean, I honestly cannot even, <laughs> yeah, I have no words. Uh, it's just really so, so, so thankful. Thanks, James. Uh, thank next, next week, we're going to have the one and only Devin Ackerman on. Uh, really excited to get to chat with Devin Ackerman and learn a bit about Devin's journey. You may know Devin from about the FIR. We are completely scheduled till the end of the year. Uh, great guests, Ladrina Sharon, Shelly Geisbrecht, Mitch Kaiser, Jad Saliba, and many, many more. Um, so you can check out magnetforensics.com backslash cash up to see a list of what's coming up, view past episodes. And thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week.